Hello and welcome to the Poetry Exchange. I'm Fiona Bennett. And I'm Michael Schaefer. Great to see you, Michael. You too, Fee. Now, I think you were quite busy last night at the Gate Theatre, I hear. I, I was. I was taking part in a performance of Dear Elizabeth um, that was using the letters and poems of Elizabeth Bishop and Robert Lowell. And um, it's this brilliant thing that Ellen McDougall has done at the Gate Theatre using different actors every night. Uh, and I was performing with Martina Laird, the amazing Martina Laird. And um, we're, you're kind of given a briefing beforehand for a couple of hours about how this thing is going to work. And you're basically following instructions off of uh, pages uh, and you don't know what's going to happen or um, what's contained within the letters. We were encouraged not to do any kind of research beforehand. Um, and it was an extraordinary experience to be a part of. I feel I'm still processing it. Um, I didn't sleep very well last night. It's all kind of buzzing around Still, in my head. I should imagine so. Goodness me, it sounds ext- it sounds very frightening to me. It wasn't particularly frightening. It, uh, Not to a skilled <laughs> performer like yourself, but gosh, to be live, just encountering yeah. the material and each other and the audience. What a brilliant idea. A really fantastic idea. And it was, uh, yes, quite unlike anything I've ever done before mm. I, I was really felt very grateful to be able to do it yeah to be asked to do it mm. as part of our journeying around the country holding exchanges and meeting people in different places we've been building a small but extended team to help us hold these conversations and on this month's episode you'll be hearing the wonderful Alison McManus who's been joining us to make things happen in Durham So in this exchange, our visitor, Mark, uses this wonderful phrase and says, I think it's important to speak about these things. And he does, in fact, in this episode um, and in the conversation, speak very eloquently and movingly about the loss of a friend through suicide. Um, And it is an extraordinary um, privilege for us to have heard that and indeed to be having the permission to share it with people on this episode. Yeah, that's right. I think the way Mark talks about it is incredible, the way he sort of holds it up and examines um, what happened for him at that time and and his relationship with it now and the ways in which the poem um, is uh, useful to him, that it plays a real part in his life as a result Um, and yeah that idea that it's important to talk about it I think comes through really clearly. So you'll be listening to Michael and Alison talking about Barcarolle by Pablo Neruda, the poem that's been a friend to Mark. Well Mark this is very exciting because to my knowledge, you're the only person we've um, had the pleasure of meeting twice. I've got something a bit different and a bit dark today, but okay. very, very significant to me. If only you would touch my heart, if only you were to put your mouth to my heart, your delicate mouth, your teeth, If you were to put your tongue like a red arrow there where my dusty heart is beating. If you were to blow on my heart near the sea, weeping, it would make a dark noise like the drowsy sound of train wheels, like the indecision of waters, like autumn in full leaf, like blood. With a noise of damp flames burning the sky, with a sound like dreams or branches or the rain or foghorns in some dismal port. If you were to blow your heart near the sea like a white ghost in the spume of the wave, in the middle of the wind, like a ghost unleashed at the seashore weeping, like a long absence, like a sudden bell, the sea doles out the sound of the heart, raining, darkening at sundown on a lonely coast. No question that night falls and its mournful blue of the flags of shipwrecks peoples itself with planets of throaty silver. 
and the heart sounds like a sour conch, calls, O sea, O lament, O molten panic, scattered in the unlucky and dishevelled waves. The sea reports sonorously on its languid shadows, its green poppies. If you existed suddenly on a mournful coast surrounded by the dead day facing into a new night filled with waves, and if you were to blow on my cold and frightened heart, if you were to blow on the lonely blood of my heart, if you were to blow on its motion of doves in flame, its black syllables of blood would ring out, its incessant red waters would come to flood, and it would ring out with shadows, ring out like death, cry out like a tube filled with wind or weeping, like a shaken bottle spurting fear. So that's how it is, and the lightning would glint in your braids, and the rain would come in through your open eyes to ready the weeping you shut up dumbly, and the black wings of the sea would wheel around you with its great talons and its rush and its cawing. Do you want to be the solitary ghost blowing by the sea its sad instrument? If only you would call a long sound, a bewitching whistle, a sequence of wounded waves, maybe someone would come from the peaks of the islands, from the red depths of the sea. Someone would come. Someone would come. Someone would come. Blow fiercely so that it sounds like a siren of some battered ship, like lamentation, gnashing and sounding. In the marine season, its conch of shadow spirals like a shout. The seabirds ignore it and fly off. Its roll call of sounds, its mournful rings rise on the shores of the lonely sea. You read that beautifully. Yeah, thank you. I came across this poem in the early 90s when I was, um, I was living as a lodger with my very dear friend, Alison. I was, I was in my early 40s and Alison was a few years younger and she needed a lodger and I needed somewhere to live. So we basically met through a, an advert in a cafe and I moved into her house and I was there in the end for six years. And one of the things she used to do was she used to get together with a couple of her women friends. They were actually quite a formidable trio and I used to, I, I used to call them the three fates. Um, and, and they used to pick a theme and they would look for images and for poems and for other pieces of writing around that theme mm. and put it together. And one thing they did was the sea and they picked this poem and it immediately just grabbed me. Mm. It's such a powerful poem. In those days I, I could only read it in English. Now I have enough Spanish to read it in the original. And Neruda was one of the reasons why I decided to learn Spanish, in fact. So Alison and I became very, very close. Um, very close friends. We were for a short time lovers. That mm. didn't work out, but after we got that out of our systems, we became <laughs> very, very intimate friends. Mm. And it was like having a, a close sister or a close cousin, and we could talk about anything and tell each other anything. And this was very important because during that time, each one of us had our lives turned completely upside down by something that happened during those years. Mm. And we were absolutely there for each other in a very accepting and uncritical way. And each of us acted as a kind of witness and holder of the other's story. And that's a very, very powerful kind of connection to mm. have with somebody. Mm. At the end of that time, Alison decided she was going to go traveling. So she went off. I had to find somewhere else to live. She went off. She traveled a lot of places in the Far East, and she ended up living and working in India. And this was in the days really just before email was really coming in as a way of keeping up with people. So that we, we kept in touch occasionally by letter. Two or three times when she was back, she'd come and visit me. Um, we'd both moved on in our lives, but there was still that, that feeling of intimacy and connection. and. Sometimes you just feel that someone is there in the world who holds that little part of you. Um, until one day, and it was quite a few years ago now, and it was a Sunday evening in May, a friend phoned me to say that Alison had died and that she'd taken her own life. Mm. And when that happens, you're left with all kinds of questions that you're never going to know the answer to. 
you know, why did it happen? Why didn't she get in touch with me? Why didn't she come? Should I have been a better friend? Should I have kept in contact more? What could I have done? All those things come up and you're never going to know. Mm. People talk about resolving things and finding closure and moving on. I don't think that happens. I think these things nestle inside you and they find a place. I'm kind of at peace with it now. Um, but every now and then I still have to take it out and kind of look at it as you might take a stone out of a box and handle it. Um, and when I do, it's always this poem that's there. And it's, you know, it's bleak and it's in some ways quite chaotic and it's, it doesn't explain itself. But then, you know, suicide doesn't explain itself either. Mm. Um, but it's possibly the only piece of writing that I could, that would go there with me. Um, the other thing to say about it, of course, is that in the light of what happened, there's a lot in this poem that becomes changed and transfigured when you give it that context. Mm. Thank you for telling us all of that and, and choosing to bring in this poem. I think it, I think it matters to speak about these things. Mm. And, and to speak about, speak about them in relation to poetry as well, because it's where poetry and the real world cross. Mm. Yeah. So, this, this isn't actually the first tran the translation that I came to know this poem through. Okay. That, that was another translation which I actually have here. Um, but I chose this one by Robert Haas, partly because of his translation of one particular word. There's a word in the Spanish which is caracola, which he translates as conch. Mm. But the, the whole notion of the conch has another implication for me, which Neruda probably didn't know about, unless it was traditional within South America as well. But the conch as a symbol is very powerful in, certainly in East Asian tradition and religion, particularly in Buddhism, um, as sometimes it's seen as being the voice of the spirit, or one Buddhist monk once told me it's thought to be the only sound that can reach between, call between the realms. Something quite interesting there, I suppose, Mark, about the fact that the version that you first met through and with Alison, um, uh, you're, you're now kind of embracing a different version. Mm. Well, I suppose what I, can, what I can do now is I can go back to the Spanish, of course, which sure. I couldn't in those yeah. days. And perhaps there's also something about not holding on too tightly to what was there at the time, you know, to allow it to change a bit, isn't it? I've only just thought of that. That's good, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. yeah, not holding on too tightly to the way things were, but moving on to something that says it a slightly different way and brings out something slightly different for me. Do you reach for it in the moments when you want to be taken back to happier times with Alison, when you want to remember her? No, I re I'd reach for it when the feelings around her death start to come up. It's not imagery that I can really pin down. It's, it, some of it seems quite chaotic, quite random, but then the feelings are like that as well. Mm. And the fact that there's a contained thing like a poem that, that both contains and has that level of chaos within it mm. Mm. Is, is, is a real help. And, you know, there's some things actually there that I would just like, you know, do you want to be the solitary ghost? <laughs> do you really? Um, you know, if only you would call, someone would come. You know, there are things in there that I still want to shake her and say to her. Um, and I don't, I have no idea what the context was in Neruda's life that might have sparked that off. Um, 
if only you would touch my heart, if you existed suddenly on a mournful coast, what does that mean? If you were to exist suddenly, what, what, what is the state of being after suicide? Mm. Do you exist? Do you not? Do spirits go through a process? Do, do they change? Does something happen? Is there any, you know, it, it formulates the question in a way that makes sense to me. But I couldn't tell you what that sense is. Have you shared this poem with other people? One or two people who are very close to me. And in fact, I'm um, very good friends with the surviving member of the Three Fates. Right. There's only one of them left now. Mm. But we are very, really quite good friends and mm. we see each other from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that I talked to her about this particular poem, but she's the other person that I can talk to about Alice and we both know what we're talking about. Mm. Who are the three fates? I mean, like in classical terms. Oh, well, they turn up in various mythologies, don't they? In both the Greek and the Norse mythology, there's one that spins the thread, and then there's one that weaves the thread, and then there's one that cuts the thread at the end. Okay. So it's symbolic of, you know, a life begun and woven and cut off. Mm. I didn't know, of course, when I named them. Wow. <laughs> we can't, I can't know this. They, they just yeah. had that slightly, I and mean, they were all really, really nice people. But they were also very, very strong women. And I don't know, that just, that just, it, that image just came to me about them. <laughs> Half jokingly, but mm. you know. And what does the title mean? A barcarol. In music, it's a kind of rhythm. It's a slow, rocking six-eight rhythm. Da 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 da. It's it's often associated with songs um, to do with fishermen or the sea or boats. There's one or two quite well-known ones, ah. um, and it kind of suggests the rocking of the waves. Quite a lot of, of sound imagery in the poem, then, isn't there? Mm. There's the train wheels, the conch, the um, the fog horns. Mm -hmm. He even said, with a noise of damp flames burning the sky. The neighing. A sound yeah. like dreams or branches or the rain. It um. would ring out with shadows, mm. cry out like a tube filled with wind or weeping. You're right, actually. There's a lot of sound in it, isn't there? And the we and the weeping, which is repeated through mm. it, isn't it? Almost as if you can hear more than you can see. Mm. It starts off very tactile, doesn't it? If only you would touch my heart, if you would put your mouth to my heart, your delicate mouth, your teeth, if you were to put your tongue like a red arrow, there where my dusty heart is beating. I love that dusty heart yeah. as well. I thought the poem was going to go somewhere else. Mm. Yes. <laughs> After that first mm. part. It seems very sexual, doesn't it? Very sensual. And then it goes in a different direction. Yeah. It's a poem very much about separation and loss. But it, it's about separation and loss, but without, it's not, it's not a clean and clear loss. It's a, it's, it's, it, there's loss, but with a lot of attachment left, mm. which is probably how I felt at the time and still feel, you know, all the, the sense of the attachment still being there and still of this person who, as I said, carried and contained so much of my own history that no one else really knew about. Mm -hmm. yeah. She was the only repository for a lot of what I was going through mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like in the same way when when one's parents die, the same thing happens because your parents carry a lot of what you used to be mm. with them, in them. I really liked what you were saying, Mark, about the place it has in the real world where, where poetry and the real world meet, I think yeah. is how you described mm. it. And yes, it is where the world and, and the poem cross, but they cross in a, more in an emotional place 
than any other kind of place. Um, it's not that it's not that the poem describes events, but emotionally it it, it happens in the same space that the events happen in. Mm. That's really beautifully put. It's a good trick if you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want this question to be reductive. Um, I, I somehow think in your hands it won't be. Um, <laughs> we, we do customarily ask the question, uh, if this poem were a friend to you, what kind of a friend would it be? It is someone else just to share the, hope, the hopelessness of it. It's another middle-aged to elderly man um, not trying to offer anything in the way of comfort or consolation or explanation but just, just sharing, the, sharing the not knowing, sharing the always not knowing, sharing the, the fact that you can't ever resolve it. It's just someone else there who understands what that's like. Barker Roll. If only you would touch my heart. If only you were to put your mouth to my heart, your delicate mouth, your teeth. If you were to put your tongue like a red arrow there where my dusty heart is beating. If you were to blow on my heart near the sea, weeping, it would make a dark noise like the drowsy sound of train wheels, like the indecision of waters, like autumn in full leaf, like blood, with the noise of damp flames burning the sky, with the sound like dreams or branches or the rain or foghorns in some dismal port, if you were to blow your heart near the sea like a white ghost in the spume of the wave, in the middle of the wind, like a ghost unleashed at the seashore, weeping, like a long absence, like a sudden bell, the sea doles out the sound of the heart, raining, darkening at sundown on a lonely coast. No question that night falls and its mournful blue of the flags of shipwrecks peoples itself with planets of throaty silver. And the heart sounds like a sour conch, calls, O oh sea, O oh lament, O oh molten panic, scattered in the unlucky and dishevelled waves. The sea reports sonorously on its languid shadows, its green poppies. If you existed suddenly on a mournful coast surrounded by the dead day, facing into a new night filled with waves, and if you were to blow on my cold and frightened heart, if you were to blow on the lonely blood of my heart, if you were to blow on its motion of doves in flame, its black syllables of blood would ring out its incessant red waters would come to flood and it would ring out with shadows, ring out like death, cry out like a tube filled with wind or weeping, like a shaken bottle spurting fear. So that's how it is. And the lightning would glint in your braids and the rain would come in through your open eyes to ready the weeping you shut up dumbly and the black wings of the sea would wheel around you with its great talons and its rush and its cawing. Do you want to be the solitary ghost blowing by the sea its sad instrument? If only you would call a long sound, a bewitching whistle, a sequence of wounded waves, maybe someone would come from the peaks of the islands, from the red depths of the sea. Someone would come. Someone would come. Someone would come, blow fiercely so that it sounds like a siren of some battered ship like lamentation, like neighing in the midst of the foam and blood, like a ferocious water gnashing and sounding. 
In the marine season, its conch of shadow spirals like a shout. The seabirds ignore it and fly off. Its roll call of sounds, its mournful rings, rise on the shores of the lonely sea. That was Michael with the gift reading of Barcarolle by Pablo Neruda, translated by Robert Haas. Our thanks go to Mark for allowing us to share the conversation with you. And also to Agencia Literaria Carmen Barcells, City Lights Books and Frederick Courtright of the Permissions Company for allowing us to share the poem with you. You can find Barcarolle in the Essential Neruda Selected Poems, edited by Mark Eisner, published by Blood Axe Books in the UK and City Lights Books in the US. As I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, this was Mark's second visit to the Poetry Exchange. If you want to listen to his first conversation with us, it was about the Derek Walcott poem, The Bounty. Uh, you can find that by looking through our catalogue. And also Alison McManus, who was in the conversation, came in and spoke to us a couple of years ago now about a D.H. Lawrence poem called Restlessness, uh, which is one of my favourites. And uh, you can also find that in our catalogue. I do love the way in doing the Poetry Exchange, poems do get passed on. So it was really, really nice that you did that. And I can't resist but ask you, Michael, after your encounters last night with Robert Lowell and Elizabeth Bishop's work, what do you want to pass on from last night as a poem for people to go and seek out? Yeah, I encountered uh, several poems last night that I'd not come across before. There was the, a Robert Lowell poem called Skunk Hour that was incredible and also uh, an, an Elizabeth Bishop poem called The Art of Losing that, uh, yes, yeah, extraordinary. Mm. That's about all for this month. We'll be back with you with another exchange next month. Until then, thank you for listening. <laughs>